Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your holy word. And we ask that you would speak to us this day. Lord, right at our point of need. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. And on this uh, Sunday, our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 66, verses 18 to 23 where the prophet gives the people of Israel and all their struggles and wrestlings what the finish line, what the end goal is. The new heavens and the new earth and when the glory of God will be revealed. Listen to the prophet Isaiah speaking the word of the Lord. As for me, because of their works and their thoughts, the time is coming for me to gather people from all nations and all languages. They will come and they will see my glory. Then I will set up a sign among them, and I will send out survivors from among them to the nations. To Tarshish, Pole, and Lud, to those who are archers, to Tubal and Javan, to the distant coastlands who have not heard my message and have not seen my glory. Then they will declare my glory among the nations. Then they will bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. They will bring them on horses and chariots and wagons and mules and dromedaries to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says the Lord. In the same way that the people of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel to the Lord's house. Even from among these people, I will take priests and Levites, says the Lord. For just as the new heavens and the new earth that I am making will remain standing before me, declares the Lord. In the same way, your offspring. And your name will stand. As often as one new moon follows another and one Sabbath follows another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. And then the writer to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. The finish line is the new heavens and new earth, but we're running the race of faith to get to that, to that destination. Listen to how the writer of the Hebrews describes it, beginning with the Old Testament saints. Hebrews eleven thirty two to 12, 1 to 3. And what more should I say? There would not be enough time for me to continue to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. By faith they conquered kingdoms, carried out justice, Obtained things that were promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edges of the sword, were made powerful after being weak, became mighty in battle, and caused foreign armies to flee. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others who were tortured did not accept their release, so they may take part in a better resurrection. Still others experienced mocking and lashes, in addition to chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were tempted. They were killed with the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, needy, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them as they wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. All of them were commended in Scripture by faith. Yet they did not receive what was promised. Because God had planned something better for us, namely that they would not reach the goal apart from us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us get rid of every burden and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author of our faith and the one who brings it to its goal. In view of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God's throne. Carefully consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinful people, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. The word of the Lord. And finally, the words of Jesus from Luke 12. Jesus went on his way from one town and village to another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? 
He said to them, strive to enter the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Once the master of the house gets up and shuts the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open for us. He will tell you in reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth where you When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown outside. People will come from east and west, from north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And note this, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father God, we give thanks and praise to you for the truth of the Holy Scriptures. And I pray that you would speak through me, your your servant, your instrument. Uh, Lord, the words that you would, uh, Lord, speak to encourage and strengthen us in these times. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You know, every single one of us here this morning who are believers in Jesus, who want to follow Jesus, we're all going to experience times where we feel like a runner in a race that's just gotten so tired and so weary, and we wonder if we can go forward. You know, so many things bombarding us and obstacles. And you think of a runner and the adverse weather and the course that you're on. So many things that, that can weary and weaken our faith. One of which is just the hostility and the opposition that we're facing for being Christians in America right now. Now, we just finished a series called Answering Objections to the Christian Faith. And... You know, those objections are coming faster and more, with, and more furious. Wouldn't you agree things are ramping up? Uh, you know, and just to give you a little snapshot, perhaps you heard the news report the, earlier in the year about a high school junior, Plainwell, Michigan, Plainwell High School, David Stout is his name. School officials suspended David for three days because... He had, with a like-minded individual at school, in a private conversation, was sharing his faith with him. And also had been privately texting some friends outside of school. And was talking about how, as we talked about last week, sex is God's good gift in the marriage relationship between a man and a woman, which excludes everything else, excludes including homosexuality, but then was talking about God's love in Jesus Christ and that he's the savior of the world. For that, he got suspended. And he was even told he should have self-reported his sharing with school officials. Are you kidding me? And uh, he was told by school officials that talking about religious beliefs or your own views about politics was forbidden and was not allowed on school campus for fear of hurting someone's emotions and feelings and that you would be offensive and be making this an unsafe place. This is where we're at. This is where we're at as a nation. This is just a snapshot of where we're going. Cancel culture and the thought police, the speech police that want to shut us down. And and that's not to mention all the craziness going on in the world or the craziness that might be going on in our lives and the struggles and the hardships that we're facing that it literally, being a believer in Jesus day after day after day can feel like you're running in a race, in a marathon. And I'm not a marathon runner. I probably never will be. I'm not a runner. I like to walk. 
Some of you in here I know have run a marathon. And you may know that experience of hitting the wall, which is a very real experience for runners, especially in a marathon, where the body just burns out of energy and becomes so tired it just cannot go forward. As one marathon runner put it, it felt like an elephant had jumped out of a tree onto my shoulders and was making me carry it the rest of the way through. (laughs) That sounds pretty bad. Well, right before the Boston Marathon a few years ago, there was an article in Harvard Health predicted what would happen to the thousands of runners. It said, quote, come tomorrow morning, about 27,000 runners will begin the annual 26-mile, 385-yard mass run from suburban Hopkinton to Boston. But if past marathons in Boston and elsewhere are any indication, perhaps up to 40% of these optimistic and determined souls will slam into a sudden sensation of an overwhelming, can't-do-this fatigue several miles into it before they get a chance to experience the glory of crossing the finish line. You know what's true of the body in a, a run is true of the soul. That we can hit spiritually a wall and reach a fatigue kind of, I don't know if I can go any further place in our faith. And I may be talking to you this morning. Some of you who feel like you've hit a wall. And you're weary. And you're tired. But God's word this morning encourages you. And it gives you strength to run the race of faith. And to not give up. To be strengthened by the Lord. To not drop out. The writer of the Hebrews, we don't know who it is. All kinds of speculations, Apollos, Barnabas, we don't know. But was writing to Jews who'd converted to Christ and were facing all kinds of persecution and hostility for their faith and and were being tempted by Jews who had not converted, who were not being persecuted. Oh, come on back. You know, why do you want to follow Jesus? Oh, that's a hard path. Why do you want to follow Jesus? And they were tempted to go back. And so the writer is saying, no, I want you to be encouraged. And he encourages us today to be encouraged, first of all, by the faithful saints who have gone before us. Those who have finished the race and are cheering us on, so to speak, saying, don't give up. So we see here in the text, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, oh, let me stop there. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, the therefore is building on what he has said before in chapter 11, where he defines faith as being sure about what we hope for and being convinced about the things we do not see. Hebrews 11.1. 1. And then he gives a whole faith hall of fame. It was by the word of God that God created the heavens and the earth. And God's people by faith trusted in the promises of his word. Even when everything in their experience like said otherwise. He goes through Abel who trusted God and whose sacrifice was accepted. But Noah when he believed God and and built an ark when everyone thought he was nuts and crazy and we've never seen a flood that you're building this ark for. Or Abraham, when God promised him that he was going to have many descendants and and be a great nation. He's near 100 and he has no children of his own. And by faith, he continued to cling to the promise of God. And Moses... When he had to run away from Pharaoh, 
And, fi- and God said, I'm going to use you to bring my people out. And it seemed impossible. And yet he trusted the promises of God. I love it. Then in our text, it's like, what more should I say? And he goes on to talk about Gideon and Brock and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel. And, man, he could have gone on. I mean, he missed, he didn't mention a couple of my favorites. Daniel, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When Nebuchadnezzar's like, I want you to bow down to a golden statue of myself. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no way. We're only going to worship the Lord our God. And they got thrown in the fiery furnace. And yet the Lord preserved them and kept them safe through it all. Or Daniel, when the decree was made that you're only pray. That was Darius, right? Boy, mine just went blank. Pray to the king and not to your God. And he prayed to Yahweh facing Jerusalem. And he was thrown in the lion's den. And yet God preserved him and God kept him safe. And all these saints who have gone before us, these holy ones of God who in faith clung to the promises of God, they testify. So we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And that word cloud, that, that reminds us of the glory cloud in the Old Testament, of the glory of God's heavenly presence. But that word cloud was also used in the Greek athletic games referring to the stadium of spectators surrounding the competitors in the arena. And so that there's a sense in which here, All the saints who have gone before us, who have kept the faith, who held on to God's promises to the end, they're in heavenly glory. And in the scriptures, they are testifying to how they held on to the promises of God and God brought them to the finish line of heavenly glory. There's also a sense, as some Bible scholars see it, that there's a sense in which they're also like the spectators. And we have no idea what that would mean. But we do know that We worship with all the angels, archangels, and all the saints who've gone before us, the church triumphant. We're in communion with them. And so there's a sense in which they're cheering us on. And they're saying, you can do it. You can do it. Don't give up. Just think of some of the founding pillars of this congregation. Some of you know Chuck, remember Chuck and Marge Lemke. Um, and other pillars like Dan Bush, Gary Bile, and others who, they finished the race. They're in heavenly glory, and it's as if they're cheering us on. They're the part of the cloud of witnesses saying, you can do it, hang in there. And they would say, and don't get distracted. And Chuck would say, you know what? Half the battle, it's all about showing up. Don't get distracted. Don't be distracted by hostility, hardship, or sin. So let us get rid of every burden and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And the picture here is of a runner in the athletic games. If they have any bulky clothing or weights on them, that they're stripping that off, shedding off that extra garments. In fact... They would strip it all off. Literally, they ran naked. I don't know if I'd want to be a spectator (laughs) for that race at all. But they would. They would strip it all off so nothing hindered them. And, And the image is to not allow anything to hinder, stop, distract us from the race. The enemy of our souls wants to burden and weigh us down. Now, all the opposition and hostility to the Christian faith, he wants to silence us. He wants to discourage us. You know, all the the uncertainties and anxieties in the world, as we look at corruption in our government and governments around the world, and the economy that looks like it's teetering on implosion, and, and just a world gone mad. And all the fears and uncertainties and anxieties that go with that. 
And that's not to mention the griefs that we face when we lose a loved one or when we start losing our own health or we lose our job or we're tempted to give in to our self-centered, disordered desires to find pleasure, to give in to the flesh. You know, the enemy wants us distract us from, from gathering in worship, from being in his word, from following Jesus every single day, from testifying to the good news. He wants to distract us from those things. He wants to ensnare us. He wants us to fall. He wants us to grow weary. He wants us to drop out. And the writer says, don't let it happen. Get rid of it. And we can do that because of our baptismal identity. You know, when you as a believer were baptized, you died with Christ. The old self-centered you drowned and died and it was put off and you have put on a new identity. That you are a new creation, that you are new in Jesus. Which means every day is a renewal of our baptism. Which means it's a putting off of the old. The getting rid of the burdens and the sin and the hardships that would that would turn us away, that would distract us, that would wear us down and be renewed in our identity. That's not who I am. I am a new creation in Christ. I have his peace. I am forgiven. So it's knowing our identity, being renewed in that, that throws off everything that would hinder us so that we may persevere. In our race of faith, each and every single day, to keep going and let us run with patient endurance the race that is laid out for us. The finish line is heavenly glory, the resurrection of the body, the new heavens and the new earth. The prophet Isaiah talked about to that this world of death and sin and darkness will be done away with. That's the finish line. And Jesus has marked out a course for us. And we're running a race of faith every single day, trusting in his promises, trusting in his word every day. And he's marked out that course, and we don't know where all the twists and the turns are. And that race is a struggle. In fact, the very word race here, agon in Greek, means contest or struggle. And... Uh, athletic context, contest in particular, especially in the context here of running, it refers to the contest of a race in an arena. And agon was also the place, could refer to the arena as well. But the root word is struggle. Yes, it's a struggle. It's hard. It's even related to the word agonia. You know what that word, where we get agony. Sometimes it does feel like agony. It's a struggle. It's hardship. And, and Jesus is the one who brings us into the kingdom, and yet it's a struggle. It's a striving. That's why Jesus said, strive. And the word there is agonizomai, related word. In other words, it's a struggle. It's strive with effort and might. Because the narrow door is Jesus. And there will be many who are like, I don't want that. It's like there's coming a day where it'll be too late. The door will be shut. And like, but wait, but wait. It's like, I don't know you. I don't know you. So the writer is saying, don't drop out. Run with patient endurance. Don't give up. It's a struggle. It's hard. Don't stop. Don't give up. And he has to tell This letter to the Hebrews telling the Christians here, don't stop meeting together. Don't stop meeting for worship, whether in person or live stream. Don't stop holding on to the promises of his word. Don't stop coming to the Lord in prayer and giving him your struggles. Don't stop being the face of Jesus to others and serving one another. Don't stop living for him. Let us run with patient endurance. There are many things that are going to say, oh, I just want to give up. I just want to drop out. Part, a big part of the patient endurance is knowing it's going to be a struggle. 
and it's going to be hard. And we can run with patient endurance as we focus on Jesus. Because he's the one who starts, who begins our faith, and he's the one that finishes it. Do you realize that? We're not the one that works up our faith. We're not the one that cranks it out and has to generate it. Oh, i got to work up more faith. Oh, my goodness. I, oh, i got to get more faith. Come on, work harder. Try harder. Look at the text here. Run with patient endurance. The race is laid out for us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author of our faith and the one who brings it to its goal. He is the one. The good news of Jesus, that's what creates in us the faith by which we believe in him. It's the good news of Jesus that strengthens our faith and gives us the endurance to run and to shed and throw off everything that would hinder us and be encouraged by the cloud of witnesses that surround us. It is the good news of Jesus that creates the faith by which we believe and by which we run. And it is the good news of Jesus that will strengthen and preserve our faith to the very end. So that Paul to the Philippians says, God who began a good work in you will bring it to its completion on the day of Jesus Christ. He's the one that's begun it. And so he says, you know, just like a runner, you got to keep your eyes, especially if it's a hundred meter dash. I mean, you can't look beside you. You got to look at the finish line and straight ahead. Look at Jesus because he's the one who calls up faith within us and gives us that endurance of faith to persevere because he's the one that has completed the course and gives you the assurance of the victory. Be assured That you have the victory because Jesus has completed the course in your place. It doesn't depend on how well you run and whether you get first place and, and whether how many times you've stumbled and fallen, but that you run, you persevere because he has won the victory for you. And that's the indication the text gives here when it says, Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author of our faith and the one who brings it to its goal. So he starts our faith, he begins our faith, he brings it to the finish line. Why? Because Jesus, in view of the joy set before him, and what was that joy? What was the finish line for Jesus? You and me to reclaim us, to win us back as broken, sinful people who turned away from the Heavenly Father, deserving death and damnation, that he gave his life. The joy before him was to have us back and bring us back to the Heavenly Father. So he ran his course from heaven and to earth, taking on our human flesh and blood, and it took him all the way to the cross. Same word, endured the cross. In other words, he ran the race to get us back. God, God's son in the flesh, enduring the mocking, the rejection from his own people, the scourging, being nailed to the cross, being stripped naked, utterly, with utter shame, and yet he disregarded the shame. It was as nothing because the joy before him was to have you back because of the great love of the Father for you and for me. He endured the cross disregarding its shame and having died for our sins, paying for it all with his death and with his shed blood to forgive us. He is now seated at the right hand of God's throne because he was raised from the dead, victorious over sin, victorious over the devil, Having conquered the grave, he rules and reigns at the Father's right hand. Having completed the course for you, the victory is assured. It is yours in Christ. Heavenly glory, relationship with the Heavenly Father, eternal life, it is yours as a gift. The victory is given to you freely by 
race. So really, our running, it's like in some races where you're on a track, and once the race is over, the winner runs a victory lap one more time around. Our run is like the victory lap. You're running in the victory that has already been acquired for you. And so it doesn't matter how many times you stumble or fall or grow weary or weak or you feel like you're coming in last place. He's won the victory for you. He said, just get up. I'll be your strength. I'll bring you to the finish line. So be strengthened. Some of, there are some in here who I know you hit a wall. Others of you are growing discouraged. Others are afraid. All of us are feeling the heat of our current circumstances in this world or even in our lives. And Jesus says, be encouraged. Because he is your strength. Be encouraged when you feel weak and tired. Be encouraged by Jesus. Look to him. Let him speak his promise to you. Verse 3, carefully consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinful people so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. He says, think about Jesus. This is God in the flesh. Think about the hostility he faced from his own people, his scourging, his suffering, his dying, his crucifixion, and what he did for you. That, that will strengthen you. A perseverance and endurance will rise up within you by the Holy Spirit. The author and finisher of your faith will be at work in you to be your rock, to be your strength, to be your refuge. And he will carry you to the finish line. This is a great story about famed Russian writer Alexander Sol Solzhenitsyn, who... Uh, Ended up departing the faith that he grew up in as a boy. He became an atheist and a supporter of Marxism and communism. And was part of the Red Army in, in World War II. And then uh, in Soviet Russia, he had the gall at one point to criticize Stalin. Oh, you don't do that. Just for criticizing Stalin, he got sent to the gulag. And he ended up also then in Siberia. <laughs> you don't speak against your all-powerful tyrant, tyrannical leaders. And it was while he was in the Siberian prison, Solzhenitsyn came to faith in Jesus. And the seeds that were planted as a boy, the Holy Spirit used and brought him to faith to realize everything he had been brainwashed by, all the propaganda. Which, by the way, there's lots of propaganda in our world today. Lord, wake people up woke him up, come to faith in Christ. And yet, those long days in prison, in a Siberian prison, there were times, as one writer put it, at one point he became so completely discouraged, he decided to just give up and die. His plan was to stop working out in the field, to lean on his shovel and wait for the guards to come and beat him to death. However, when he stopped, another prisoner who was also a follower of Jesus came up and um, reached over with his shovel and quickly drew a cross at his feet in the ground for a few seconds and then covered it up before any guards could see it. That right there, just that visible reminder of the cross of Christ was enough. Considering his suffering Savior to encourage him Sultanison later said that his entire being was energized by that little reminder of the hope and courage we have in Christ. He found the strength to continue because a fellow believer cared enough to remind him of our hope. And you see, that's a key point there. We don't run this alone. Let us run. We run as, a, this is Team Jesus, as the church together 
As all the saints before us are cheering us on. And Jesus is the one who is the strength of our faith. Who will bring us to the end. And he says hang in there. Hold on to the promise of my word. Because he is the strength that will get you to the end. To the finish line. Of the glory that is already yours. The victory that he has purchased and promised you. With his shed blood. The victory is yours. So let's run the victory lap. Amen? Please stand.